apart from break everyone um we have with us today our professor undubisi ikikwe um everyone knows who a renowned professor is he is the chairman of fast micro uh, group um which has a portfolio of diversified conglomerate he is the uh, also the uh, chairman of the Techidia uh, Institute, a Harvard Business Reviewer. Uh, everyone knows who he is in the diaspora. He's a venture capitalist. If I have to list his achievements, um, I will be here the whole day. And on top of it all, just last week here, a university where he is the visiting professor has uh, uh, two of the alumni who created a unicorn new startup that everyone wants and that is the babcock university in nigeria and uh, the uh, product those uh, alumni created which is the pay stack everyone may have heard it in the news uh, has just uh, be acquisited by um, the stripe uh, for over 200 uh, million. So that kind of give you a mindset of uh, what a professor has done for uh, the country. So without further ado, I'm going to leave the floor to uh, Professor uh, Ndubisi Ekikwe. Uh, sir, go ahead, please. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, distinguished ladies and uh, gentlemen. I just want to confirm that uh, uh, I'm audible. Uh, just confirm, please. Mm. Yes, I can hear you. OK, great. So thank you so much for the invitation. It's quite a moment and a great uh, privilege to have this opportunity of speaking before you all in this capacity. I'm actually speaking from the United States at the moment. And just like I'm doing that, I also send um, my, my kind of uh, statement on what just happened in the Nigerian nation yesterday about the massacre in Lakey. So please, um, uh, we are all in pains, and but we will get through this together as a people. So uh, let's stay strong. Uh, let's stay strong. It will it will be fine. So today I will be speaking on a topic. I've titled it Pythagoras Numbers and Blockchain. Essentially, we'll be looking at the constructs looking at how the old centuries uh, postulation by great men like Pythagoras, we can come connect it back to what is happening in the domain of, of blockchain and also the DeFi. So to do that, I'll take you back where it all began. And, and it all began during one of the finest moments in history, during the time of the great debate. The Great Debate was one of the most fascinating moments in the history of humanity where some Greek philosophers were trying to answer a very important question. What is the material component of the universe? In other words, what is this world made up of? That was the time of Thales, time of Pythagoras, time of Heraclitus, And so many of them were trying to give us an answer what the world is made up of. Tells say that the world is made up of water. In other words, for, for Tells, everything on earth could be put into a molten form. Anything on earth could be put into a liquid form. Because if everything on earth could be put in a liquid form, the implication for Tells is that the world is nothing but water. Heraclitus say that the world is made up of fire. According to Heraclitus, his postulation was that everything could be burnt. And because everything could be burnt, it means that the world is nothing but made up of fire. But I like what Pythagoras said. Pythagoras is the guy that gave us a Pythagoras theorem that in a right angle triangle, if we take the individual squares of the opposite and adjacent and you sum them together, you get a square of the hypotenuse. Pythagoras stated that the world is made up of numbers. And if the world is made up of numbers, the implication is that the world and everything we do on earth is nothing but numbers. The business of humanity is a business of numbers. 
the business of medicine is nothing but the business of numbers. The business of accounting is the business of our numbers. The business of finance is the business of numbers. In other words, everything we do as a people is nothing but numbers. So the implication of that is that if the world is made up of numbers, it means that computing, manipulating, processing, making sense of numbers is the business of humanity. It means that our ability to understand the, the numbers of nations, the numbers of companies, the numbers of firms and individuals will actually create our understanding of the universe around us. So if the world is made up of numbers, man has to make sense of numbers. So through human history, we have seen that kind of work. It began from the time of Abacus and Slide Rule to the time they started moving into creating the first electronic machine called the Difference Engine, one of the first computational machines ever created. What they were trying to do here is this, that if the world is made up of numbers, we have to create systems, we have to create tools that will help us make sense of numbers. From the Abacus or the Slide Rule, we went all the way the time the difference in genes was as Babbage to the time of the ENIAC and UNIAC towards the early part of the last century. But as that was happened, great things started happening in the world. Because if the world is made up of numbers, our capacity to process, manipulate, make sense of the numbers is also the only thing that will create leverageable factors, competitive advantages for firms and nations around wherever we have existed as women. So in 1937, a man called Shockley invented the transistor. And the version of transistor was one of the most successful moments because that was actually the time for the very first time we could have the capacity to have what they call passive IT devices. The devices means that the amplification became possible in electronic system, not just doing away with the passive system, the capacitors and inductors. But the world was also transformed when von Neumann created the stock product concept, giving us for the very first time our ability to have the capacity to store data right to the computational systems. But everything changed when Robert Noyce and Jao Kibi invented the integrated circuits in 1957. The invention of integrated circuits became a quintessential moment in the history of humanity. They changed the world we lived and the path of moving to in computational systems which are very critical for us to understand the world we live because the world is made up of numbers but Pythagoras, we can now begin to move from firms and companies into computational systems that can be used in families and homes. So we are now on that verge of moving from industrialized computing to personal computing. But a young man in 1975 called Bill Gates he saw the future, he said, with these microprocessors they have built in Intel, I have a mission. I can organize them, put them, that families and people can actually help can buy and acquire these devices. So computational systems now evolve from becoming systems that were just good enough for companies and farms and nations to ones where individuals can actually buy them. So we now got into this whole domain of personal computing. And as we got into that, we now saw laptops and saw desktop and things started changing. As that was happening, something was happening. The data of nations, the capability of making sense of everything, they became easier. Because now we are having computational systems that can make sense of numbers. Because if everything is about numbers, it means that market systems are all about numbers. And if the market systems are all about numbers, it means that having numbers can help us to understand the efficacy, the efficiency in the utilization of factors of production. Because when you are talking about blockchain, when you're talking about DeFi, 
you are also trying to see how you can combine, recombine factors of production to bring efficiency in the market system. Because every market has a level of imperfection. Because markets are not naturally perfect. There is an information asymmetry. An information asymmetry has to be fixed. And I'll show you these little plots here, this figure here. In every market system, there is a friction. And friction is a problem that exists in a market. And it's also that friction that is the reason why we develop the blockchain apps and the DeFi apps. Because if there is no friction in the market, there will not be a need for the company. The reason why we have companies is because markets have frictions. And when we see those frictions, we see them as opportunities. And it's only when we have acquired capabilities that we begin to build products and services that can help us to go and overcome those frictions. So in this case here, yeah, you have the demand, the person that needs a fission to be fixed, and you have the supply, the person bringing the solution to fix that friction. But because markets are imperfect, the relationship between this demand and supply cannot easily come into a perfect equilibrium by fear. And what happens? You need to have to build products and services. You need to now build products and services. And building products and services typically require having companies. And because we need to have companies of fees or frictions, we need now to now think about the capabilities that we have in order to fix those friction. I'm trying to connect that the whole elemental constructs of blockchain, the device, these things and the apps they are going to build upon are necessary because there are frictions which exist in the market. And those frictions are there because these markets are imperfect. And I'll give an example. I just landed on the street of Lagos, and let's assume there is no restaurant, and I'm hungry, and I want to eat food. The only option I have is to begin to knock at every door in Lagos, asking people if they have food to sell. I'll knock at the first door, knock at the second door, knock at the third door. And as I shall keep knocking on the doors, I'll be asking people, do you have food? You agree with me that our system is not a perfect system. It's a largely unproductive process because I have this propensity that I can knock at the first hundred doors and they don't have food to sell. And because of the stochastic, non probabilistic model that I cannot efficiently predict whether I'm going to have luck on the 20th or the 30th or the 40th knocks, it's a system that doesn't make sense. But at the same time I'm knocking at the door, there could be a family or someone who has food to sell. But I may not, unfortunately for me, get to knock at that person's door. So what happens? Somebody says, no, this thing is not working. Let me go and open a restaurant, call it ABC restaurant, so that any other day NBC is hungry, he doesn't need to be knocking at the doors. He just goes to that restaurant, because when he goes to that restaurant, he is sure that there will be food and I will pay for that and then I'll eat food. What has happened is that the ABC Restaurant Limited has fixed a friction which existed and has actually made it possible that demand and supply has come into a near equilibrium point where transaction can take place. And that capacity is the reason why that company, ABC Restaurant, had existed. This framework, this ordinance, cuts across industrial sectors or geography. This is actually why we need companies, because markets have frictions, and only companies have the capacity to provide products and services for us to fix those frictions. The same thing in bank. I have got $1,000. I don't have to use it for anything, at least for the next one year. And I'm looking for somebody whom I can lend that money. 
I say, oh, I lend it to you, pay me 10% interest rate for the year. And at the same time, I'm looking for that person that is also that propensity that somebody is looking for 1,000 Naira and he's ready to pay 17% as interest rate. I can look for him the first day, look for him the second day, look for him the third day. And he can also be looking for me. He may not find me. I may not find him because markets are perfect. The numbers in markets are not aligning. That's where I can find him. There is an asymmetry of information. He can't find me. I can't find him. So what happens? A group of young men wake up and say, let's go and start a bank. Let's create a product. They basically come here and put your 1,000 bucks. We pay you 10% interest rates that you say you want. And once that happens, you say, okay, Mr. A, you need $1,000 in loan. Come here, you pay us 17%. The difference of 7% becomes the fee they have imposed on the system in order to melt, to dissolve, to push and overcome the friction, which has existed between me and that person. But because the bank has brought us into a near perfect equilibrium, where my 1,000 gets a 10% interest rate, and he gets his 10,000, 1,000, I was also paying the 17%. The bank charges that fee of 7% for the overcoming force through a product or service it has exerted to overcome the friction of force which has existed before us. So this ordinance, even what we're doing in blockchain, what we are doing in DeFi, was you are saying, even in the banking system, there is still an element of friction. How can we use the numbers to create a better equilibrium point by actually having a, a decentralization process? The decentralization process now makes it possible that you can now organize the formation of the equilibrium point at a level where data can make it easily more better. So I have just want to send that money, like say from New York to somebody in Lagos, and I have to send that money first to a bank in New York, Wall Street, and it goes to another bank, a correspondent bank, a bank like in Lagos. The correspondent bank needs about two days to confirm payment. They now wire it to the one in Nigeria. It takes another day. At the end of the day, you're losing two, three days. And because of that, a friction has been introduced because money has velocity and time. If you delay it an extra day, intrinsically, you still have the absolute value of the money. But the propensity and the potency and the value of that money because of time, you diminish it. Just if somebody is going to a hospital and you need to make a deposit and you are now bringing the money three days and if the hospital say if you don't pay we can't touch that individual it means that even when the money has arrived without the money arriving instantaneously you have actually lost value on that money not necessarily the absolute value of the monetary terms but you've lost money on the velocity of the usage of that fund so when you now say let decentralize it, what is happening is that you are now bringing a new nexus on how you can bring those constructs of numbers in order to make it possible that you can pursue the efficiency and the utilization of factors of production, which are very critical for people to move funds around territories. So it comes down to something that is very critical, an ordinance of trade. And this ordinance of trade has always existed across centuries. A time when the world was purely inventive. We're in a world where there were so many ideas, but there were very few products and services. You could look at the GDPs of the world, you could see using the United States and, Canada, and, and China, you could see that for centuries, the GDP was flat. And this GDP was flat, but over a time, the GDP started ramping up. And the other implication here is that if GDP was ramping up, it means that the web, you know, the city was accelerating. Key thing here is having this capacity that if we understand the numbers around nations, if we make sense of the numbers around nations, 
If you make sense about our numbers, about industries and sectors, industrial system, it means that we can improve human productivity. We can improve industrial systems. So if you look here, as computational systems began to advance, as computational systems began to evolve, you see that the GDPs of nations were actually tracking. And that is what is happening today. As the world moves into data sciences, and the world moves into artificial intelligence, we can unlock more value because by having the data, the world can build better ways of fixing frictions which exist between demand and supply. And there is this clear correlation that the computational power of the world, the ability for the world to understand itself by making sense of numbers, because the world is nothing but numbers, according to Pythagoras, and we have to build systems to make sense of numbers. And the more and efficient we are in building those systems to make sense of the number, the more capacity for us to solve problems in society, the more capacity for us to fix friction to resist society, the more capacity for us to actually provide a better equilibrium point for demand and supply to play. That is going to become the great change, the great redesign that we are having in the world of data sciences, in the world of big data, in the world of artificial intelligence, because they are making sense of the most critical cardinal point, making sense of numbers. Now, when you now bring blockchain, the blockchain takes you into an exponential redesign of a process that has largely been at best quadratic. Because if you now build this blocks and pockets, making it possible that you can improve speed and even when keeping privacy at the same time, you can have multiplier effect that gives you things in quadruple. And if you do that, you can now see a financial system that is evidence-based, not at a regional concentrated, centralized way, but also at a decentralized way. In short, I tell people this, that if you go back to the Asian market systems, where people transact their businesses locally, it was actually largely a decentralized system. There was no national currency, but they really knew how they were issuing loans. They knew how they were organizing themselves. But the most important thing, there were also data systems they were using to make inferences. You know, they will tell you, this man, has taken loan and he paid. And we know him as an honorable man. He is qualified to join our cooperatives because in this cooperative, we want to build it as a people, to grow it. And then if you go to another city, they have their own cooperative of farmers. You go to another one, they have their own cooperatives of farmers. It means that they have figured out how they can build a, a decentralized operating system organizing themselves, pulling resources together for them to drive and serve services fine. And what this blockchain um, DeFi largely bringing the world to how the world was largely, even many, many, many centuries ago. Many things and some of the most accomplished things in the world, they were not actually centralized. People build schools, people build churches, people build mosques. People build roads. And then because the energies of people came because of trust, you know your neighbor, and all of you want to live in peace. So you come contribute your resources to do that. In my village in Abia State, during the time when just Nigeria was going through the time of restoration after the Civil War, they just say, hey, we are not expecting the federal government to come here and do schools for us. We're not expecting them to come here and do hospitals for us because there's no way they will do that. But they just finished bombing us. Let's do one thing. Let everyone contribute money. Let's build our schools. Let's build churches. Let's build uh, 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 community hospitals and clinics. And they started building. And that was what happened across most parts of the world. People were building things in decentralized. But of course, over time, because of sophistication, because of productivity system, we now said, okay, let's now figure out how we have a centralized process. But there is one thing that technology has done in our time, that you can still have 
a system that is advanced, a system that is sophisticated, and yet still be decentralized. It's just like saying, how can somebody ship something, buy something on Amazon, and get it delivered, even though there are thousands or millions of transactions happening every single, every single hour. So it's because technology has made it possible that Amazon can make sense of millions of transactions in a month and still everyone that paid for something will still get that item easily. It's a, the productivity element that technology makes possible. So what is happening here is that better computational systems, computational system here includes both software architecture, both the frameworks of software, as well as the real microprocessors that we can now have systems like blockchain, making it possible for man to return back to how it all began, where decentralization was actually the most cardinal element as nations were viewed. You know, when people talk about how do we unite the world, you can unite the world in a central core, but there are really things that are better done at a decentralized level. So the evolution of all this is building applications. And those applications have to be applications built on evidence. And those constructs will now take you into building capabilities. And if you can have those capabilities, you don't begin to build solutions at a low downstream level. I call it downstream in the sense that Downstream are things everyone participates in. Everyone can participate in downstream using the petroleum industry, distribution and marketing of crude products. But the upstream is where there is an extra value. Very few people can participate at the upstream. Interestingly, for you to participate at the upstream, you need a lot of capabilities. And those capabilities are things that are not common. You see Shell, as a mob, Konoko Phillips, they participate at the upstream. Why the local Nigerian companies are involved in distribution and marketing? Because they do not have, they have not acquired enough capabilities in order for them to participate at that high level where you have the upstream. Interestingly, the greatest value is created at the upstream, at the top, not at the downstream. So evidence-based, when you are operating at that level, building this system that can be tested and the validation and hypothesis upon which they have built, you begin to move into that dimension of awesome. And when you do that, something happens. You create possibly a new basis of competition. I'm looking into the dimension where blockchain and DeFi can create a new basis of competition in markets in Africa and Nigeria and also some parts of the world. Like we have just seen in Paystack, a Nigerian startup, a Nigerian operating startup that just was acquired by Strive for 200 million. The moderator just mentioned it. What is happening here? They created a new basis of competition. The what they say there that what, if you watch the video, in the, in the original initial video, they are saying here, see, everyone could claim they have an API for, for collection of ferment. But we have seen that most of them are really primitive. Everyone could say that they have all this way of helping people collect money online. But we have seen, and I'm telling you as someone who actually paid for, I sent a bank graph of equivalent of $1,000 then to a competitor then calling task switch for just for the opportunity to be given the right for me to collect money through our website. So in task switch, it took it about nearly a month. They received the, the, the 1000 the band graph, they collected it, they cash it, they send their engineer to review our code, they send their engineer after we have done the integration to check that our their logo is on our website. They requested that their, their logo has to be positioned in a visible way so that when somebody comes to our website, they know that, hey, we are using uh, InterSwitch to collect money. They, they have their own rules that this is the way it must be done before you have an opportunity of having their API to be put on your website for you to receive cash. But these guys say, no, I need to set a new basis of competition. I need to do something different. And what do you mean by a new basis of competition? It's when you are now looking at that data, bringing that evidence, the market systems.
If you do that very well, something happens. You do not serve the needs of your customers. You do not serve the expectations of your customers. You begin to shape the perceptions of your customers. And I'm very confident that as we go into building these their device solutions, especially in most developing part of the world, we are going to take market systems beyond the needs, expectations to the level of perception. The needs of customers are things customers know they need. I need electricity, that's a need. If you give it to me from cold, you've met my needs. But if I'm an environmental activist and you give me electricity from cold, you've met my needs, but you've not met my expectation. If anyone comes to me with renewable energy source and say, take it, renewable energy source at the same cost, I will say, that man who has met my needs, I have gotten somebody who met my needs, but he has also met my expectation. I'm counseling your service. I'm going with a man who has met my expectation. The point is this, even though the banks of today are meeting our needs, in some cases, not most of them are meeting our expectation. So when you see these fintech companies that are coming up, growing in like a boobal tree, they are companies that are meeting the needs and also going at the level of perception. Perception is what happens when you give customers what they have never even imagined was a possibility. They never even imagined that that product or service was even possible. But the day they see that, they will say, this is what I've been looking for. When I was still in secondary school, in, in 1990, 1991, Diamond Bank, a bank in Lagos, began the product introduce a product they call the Dagon Integrated Banking System. Diamond Integrated Sanding Banking System Right. Um, it looks like there is um, a disconnection here. Uh, let me try to get him back on stage. Um, so why I do that, let me um, bring other people on stage as well. Yes, Solomon, we can hear yes. you. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, so let me just quickly try to um, locate uh, a prof. Uh, on the, um, Nassim, if there is anything, you can just uh, just start um, chatting uh, while I try to do the back end. Um, let me see if... Uh... I can't see the chat box, uh, Solomon, for some reason. Where oh, the it? chat box. Right, I can I see can it here. See it. Right, yeah. maybe I need to go to the main stage, isn't it? The the yes, you need. Uh, you oh, come. No. Yeah. Uh, no, on the on the right hand side of the screen, there is a chat box. I'm I'm trying to see if uh, Prof is back online. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, it was there. It now, but it was eh? there before. Yeah. Okay. The chat box. Right. Was there before just now. But Oh no, let me try to see if I can get hold of him.
Okay, we're just waiting um, for Prof to come back. Okay. Okay. Solomon, what happened to the, 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 the chat box? Uh, were you saying something, um, Dr. Nassim? No, I'm saying what happened, to the, what happened to the chat box because it was here before. I think you have made okay. me speaker. I, if you remove me from a speaker, Okay, because Hello? right. So if you, oh, okay, yeah, so he's back. Prof, he's back. Yeah. Okay, so let me. Okay, great. So Prof, uh, welcome back. It looks like you are on mute. Um, so go ahead and uh, share your screen. I'm sorry that uh, uh, you got disconnected. We're really sorry for that. Okay, that's okay. Let me. Uh, you can hear me. Let me just. Yes, uh, yes I can. Okay, let me just. Uh, where is sharing? Okay. I think I'm actually just rounding up. Uh, let me okay. just uh, so um so share screen. Okay. Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah. Okay. So you can see on my screen, right? Yes, okay, great. I yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So uh, just trying to explain that the question here is how do you essentially uh, have these products at the level of perception. And the level of perception means that bringing these applications to the point, not just meeting the needs, expectations of customers, but also at the level of the perceptions of customers. And, and there are so many lessons that we can learn. I just explained the Diamond Integrated Banking System from the Nigerian banking sector, a bank that was so innovative that it changed the whole rules of banking. And it also brought something which was extremely very critical, that most times people try to compete on cost. But Diamond Bank said, hey, if I can make it possible that you can put your money in one branch of a bank in any city and you can operate the same account, irrespective of the location where that account was open, we are going to introduce a fee called commission on turnover. Commission on turnover is nothing that says, Anytime you withdraw your money, I'll toss you. I'll take a percentage of small amount. You know what happened? Nigerians did not bother. They say, hey, if I take 1,000 Naira and they take five Naira, that's okay. Because by taking that five Naira, they are saving me more than 100 Naira I would have wasted by returning back to that city, to that old branch, when I opened that account and wasting maybe four hours to get my money. So it's better I just give them five naira. That is perception. That is moving customers into something new. And this is also a validation that most times building strategies should not just be based on reduction of cost. Because sometimes you can create value that the customers will appreciate to pay for. And they made commission on turnover to become an industry standard. Or of course, other banks quickly ramped up, started, and said, okay, we'll give you the same thing. Give you the same thing, and, and that became that. So what the implication here is, commission on turnover became a standard in the Nigerian banking sector. And I also take you to Apple. Apple is a product that works at the level of perception. Apple is not necessarily just a product. It's something more than that. The best time a company has in its life is when it has moved its users from the position of being consumers to customers. Customers are people that they come and they come. They come and buy. They come back and come back. Consumers are people they just buy and they leave. 
But the greatest of all is getting customers into the level of fandom. They become fans. They are no more consuming products. They are now advocates and apostles of your brand. For these blockchain products and applications, the question here is how do you get these fans out of your products? It's all about if you understand the data around the fans, if you understand the data around the markets, you grade the evidence in order to engineer something that will take them into the level of fandom. A young man lives in New York. He has just gotten a job about a few weeks ago. He earns an average of $1,200 every two weeks. There is a new iPhone. He takes a day out of work. He works hourly wage. That means he will not get paid. He leaves his house 4 a.m. in the morning to key up at the electronics chain where he could buy the new iPhone. By 4 a.m., he's already waiting on the line. The chain opens at 8 a.m. He's the first guy that got in. Goes in, he takes his two weeks of wage, hands it over as a credit card. They give him an iPhone, they take the money. He comes out, he opens, puts on a video. He videos how he carries the phone, the package. He's videoing how he's opening it and he's streaming it on Instagram. And he's telling the world this is it. And when he finishes, he takes a picture and says, this is the new iPhone. I got it, people. That guy is not just a customer. He is a fan. And because he's a fan, he becomes a tribe of the Apple tribe. How do you build with data? Having evidence. Have to have the capacity to make tribes out of your brand. And I also have seen what Intel did many years ago when Intel said, hey, I'm competing with AMD. I make microprocessors and AM, AMD makes microprocessors. The customers were not recognizing that we are actually more than just what they think we are. Because if you want to buy a laptop, you see HP laptop, you see their laptop, you never see Intel laptop. But the most important element in that laptop was engineered by Intel. They say, no, we can't allow that to be. Let's get into the perceptions of customers. Let's say if that laptop, Windows laptop, does not have Intel inside, it means it's not a real laptop. It's a fake laptop because Intel is not the microprocessor that was powering it. And just because of that sticker, Intel changed the dynamics of the personal computing industry. And people went into the market. I remember I was still in university. I was in Patakot. I wanted to get a laptop. I say, does he have Intel? He doesn't have Intel. It can't be an, it can't be a laptop. So people now stop asking, is that a Dell laptop? Just only that. They start saying, okay, Dell laptop. But does he have Intel inside? AMD nearly went bankrupt because no one wanted the AMD laptop. Even though the cool and quiet technology that AMD invented was actually a better, superior technology than what Intel at that time. You know, I hold a PhD in microelectronics. I build these things. And if you go back to the industry and discuss the constructs, what was happening, how a marketing sticker changed the ordinance in the microprocessor industry. What I'm trying to say here is that it's, it does, that evidence is understanding how you can create products and services at the level that you can take a new dimension to your customers. And I'll just rounding it up here by giving you the point of laser. Yes. HP was trying to get into the market of printing. There was so many, there were so many competitors. Les Mark, uh, there was Eros. And if you have work, and there was Canon, I work in the banking sector in Lagos many, many years ago, actually because of the Diamond Integrated Banking System. When I was graduating from university, I said I would like to actually have an opportunity of working in that bank. So when I got in there in the night, we were IT guys, they would ask us to print all the documents that happened in the bank so that the tenor control can validate with the man just to make sure that no one has cooked any data in the database over the night. So you print it here, that was the dot matrix printer. So noisy, so slow. And one afternoon, the company said, we are coming with a printer. The name is LaserJet. 
People say, what happened? Laser? Noiseless? Jet is fast. Let's go for it, people. That was it. So my point is taking that new basis of competition is a very critical element. As we move into that dimension of building blockchain and device solutions. It's not just about the technology that we win customers. It's also how you communicate the technology. It's not just about the sophistication. It's also how you put it. So winning that comes down to that data and making sure that data is not just focusing on building the technology starts, but also making sure even the perceptions of customers, you can win them. If you can combine all of them together, you accomplish that noble cause of fixing market friction, which exists between demand and supply. Our ability to make sense of numbers, our ability to build solutions at scale, to shrink and remove that friction, is the only purpose why companies, why products, why service, why they exist. Thank you, Lou. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Ndibisi Ikikwe. Oh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Right. Um, let me see if there are questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Nassim, um, please help me on this. I could be all over the place. Okay. And I think there is one from uh, Patrick here. Uh, Dr. Nassim, check if you if you are on mute. Um, the questions here. Um, okay. I'm just checking on any in social media if there is anything. Um, okay. All right. Okay. So, okay. Thanks for that. Um, okay. I think somebody just leave a message. Okay, so, right, so we we go for... There was one question, um, Solomon, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, Professor, about okay. um, communicating. You mentioned it's not enough to just, you know, launch new technologies. It's important to communicate. Um, what are his views on, are we, are we good at communicating innovation? communicating uh, new technologies that can help the society and uh, make the world a better place? Are we doing a good job? And how can we do this better? Okay, yeah. Professor. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it's really a game plan. And that is actually where that evidence supported by data comes in. Um, interestingly, there are so many ways um, great companies create a kind of perception in the minds of customers. Um, if, you, if you match it side by side, there are so many phones that can do fairly decent work when you have the iPhone. But when you ask people, uh, give me the best phone in the world, uh, the, the near universal answer will be that is the iPhone. So uh, when Apple tells you, okay, um, uh, we are launching this product, uh, we are going to have an Apple uh, conference, the New York Times will send uh, uh, journalists, BBC will like to cover it, CNN will like to cover it live. But I'm not sure there is any brand in the world that can get that kind of free press without find, looking for millions of dollars or pounds to pay for it. So it also comes down to karata. When it comes to karata, means that if we communicate and elevate demands, you can mark, 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 you match it up. So people believe that they are not necessarily going to be disappointed. So CNN will not say, "Okay, we just cover this speech by Tim Cook," and 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 it didn't offer anything. So these are the, the the viewers who say you just wasted our time. But because of the revelation as a result of how Apple is taking people into that dimension, they are not. Uh, people think they can do this. So communication is not necessarily about what the technology is, but it's also about the ability to take people towards a journey. Tesla 
Tesla Elon Musk crazy kind of imagery that you don't know what next is coming. And if he tells you there will be an announcement about Tesla tomorrow, I, I promise you that uh, if it's possible, there is no BBC reporter here in the United States. They would like to send somebody across the Atlantic to come and know what Tesla has to say. But if GM says there will be something next week, I promise you no one will even show up. So it's, it's about the personality and it's also about your record. Your record speaks more than even what you say. And that's, that's a fact. So when brands communicate, it goes beyond their press releases. It goes beyond to the authenticity and the validation of their past statements. If people see those things that they always matched up, great things, great things happen. And I'll tell you, it's actually the most important asset a company could have. Apple could be saving not less than $200 million on, a, on free press advertisement, on, on end media. I just end media, people just talk about it. And you may not even need to advertise because everyone knows that Apple is doing something. And, and that's something that you cannot afford to, to, to miss. Wow. Uh, Thank thanks uh, for that, uh, Professor. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nassim, is there any other um, question uh, in the chat? No, I think there's no more okay right um yeah so we expected <laughs> quite a, a much more bigger audience today just as i have spoken earlier and professor uh, ndbc uh, has also uh, reiterated um uh, there is on um there is an event in uh, lagos um that has kind of um uh, blocked the internet or there's an interruption of the internet going on at the uh, moment. Okay, so um, we just have uh, uh, one more session to go uh, before uh, we um, call it um, a day. So I'm going to put the next slide on. Um, so I will go through uh, the slide, then um, we will all be on stage and um, call it a day. Um, Dr. Nassim, if you can see my slides, let me know. Okay. Yes, I can see your slides. Yes, I can okay, see. Right. You. Okay, that is great. So I will just go on uh, with this slide. In fact, this slide was designed for uh, the audience uh, we expected uh, from Nigeria. We had about 100 plus registration. Uh, at the moment, um, there's quite um, there's no one connecting from there. Uh, the internet internet is intermittent. Okay, so I will just quickly go through, and uh, some of them may not be relevant to you, but it's a source of information in case um, you are planning on investing in uh, Nigeria. Okay, so, so Solomon, just, um, one thing, uh, just one thing that the this recording will be available on the YouTube, so anyone who was not able to attend should be able to watch it afterwards. Yes, and Emmit is also recording um, all um, all our presentations so far has been recorded on uh, Emmit, and the uh, YouTube channel also has it. If it's not there, we can always ret retrieve it from Emmit and push it to the YouTube channel. Okay, all right. Any other thing? Okay, no, I think let me go ahead. Fun. Okay, that's great. So building sustainable cost efficient blockchain application for Africa. Now, before I start this, um, there are three areas I want to look at. Okay, scaling the public and private sector with evidence-based uh, blockchain. I've been very active um, since the lockdown um, that uh, I moved on from my day job uh, to some of that thing. I've been very active on uh, with the British uh, Blockchain Association. We had an event in April. Um, that was a global event. I presented there on a project I worked on, on using blockchain to address counterfeit issues. Uh, so I kind of structured this presentation into three aspects. So skilling um, the public and private sector with evidence-based blockchain. Now, the discussion so far, starting from the opening keynote, 
with um, the presentation by Dr. Koranteng uh, and uh, Professor Ndibisi uh, Ikikwe is all on evidence based. Now, what is the beauty of that? Having the right resources makes a difference, especially in Africa, if you want to build sustainable uh, blockchain. Now, the idea that there are universities there that will change your life, the internet has made education a great leveler. So you now have access to the best universities in the world, Cambridge, MIT, uh, through the internet, you have access to, to it. Now, blockchain is an interesting area. It is born out of activism. So if you want to participate in this ecosystem, you need to build from scratch. It is not uh, those who uh, have a briefcase of money going somewhere to tell someone to do the job for them. We never make a headway in blockchain. So you need to get your hands dirty. So I will be looking at this area of it, local developers and coding initiatives in blockchain, and also the open source. Now, if you need to if you need to build sustainable blockchain in Africa using a proprietary system where you have to lock in, you will not be able to afford it. Now, the good news about blockchain that a lot of people are not aware of, there are algorithms not available or consensus mechanism that you do not need to consume a lot of power. Um, so we can build this system from scratch. All you need is people who have the right skills that can write codes, a bit of mathematics. They can build um, the blockchain system. So let me dive into the discussion. I wanted to just uh, spend some time here because this is what the discussion is all about. Able to do it yourself, then skill up local developers, then uh, use uh, Linux based project. This is the takeaway of the presentation. Now, Nigeria is quite interesting. In fact, there were certain things I haven't actually looked at, um, not before this presentation. And it was actually shocking to actually find out 82% of the Nigerian population of 206 million are are actually below 40. In fact, it was an eye opener for me. And I, when I also looked at the data, I find out from teenager, which is 10 to 14, to below 40 is 50.9%, which is quite interesting. So you're looking at about 103 million or 104 million as a very young population. Then if you add the newborns to 10 to it, you end up with almost uh, 160 million plus, which is quite interesting, young population. Now, when I delve deeper, I also find out 27.1% in the second quarters are unemployed. Now, how do we find a solution to this? Now, blockchain is actually designed for Africa. The, as Dr. Uh, Corante has uh, presented, there is a lot of opportunities here. So we, you are going to be creating blockchain products. You are going to be bringing bringing data into the project. Example of that is what we call the Oracle. These are normal IT operations that you do entering of data. This needs to come into blockchain, a lot of opportunities there. Okay, so if you are thinking of those number on employment, this is a, where the government should be heading into, invest in this area, provide a lot of jobs. Now, also in blockchain, you are going to be solving uh, social issues, uh, standards. It provides a lot of opportunity. There is no waste. Okay, so now there was also a kind of interesting 
um, discovery. So if you look at Nigeria, there are other data for other countries. You have about 72% of internet usage. As I've said earlier, education has become um, uh, flat or in the sense that you now have a great leveler with the internet. So they can have access to peer-reviewed, open access journal across the world. Example of that is the Journal for British Blockchain Association, which is a good news here. Now, on the slide, uh, the image on the right, we actually have about 2 million to 3 million vying for admission, 2 million precisely vying for admission every year. Uh, 600,000 places are available. So the rest uh, takes overseas education. But with internet, you really don't need that. Anywhere in the world, you could access uh, world-class resources. Now, just uh, as I planned this event, coincidentally, today uh, there, there is an event this week in Nigeria, which most of you may have heard of. And last night, there was um, a quite unfortunate in, uh, incident. Um, the internet is being blocked at the moment. Uh, I had almost about 100 plus registration. Uh, no one has been able to connect. Even a speaker who's supposed to be on at this moment has not been able to uh, join in. Okay, now this brings, um, this makes this uh, slide interesting. Uh, this, sli uh, this slide was um, intended for some other things, but it also uh, kind of encompass uh, this aspect or the moment we are today. It is insufficient to protect ourselves with laws. We need to protect ourselves with mathematics. That is Brooks Snyder. Now, the whole idea of blockchain, cryptocurrency, is all based on activism. So if you love the money of blockchain, expect whoever that is in cryptography is more or less an activist. So if you look at the issues they are having in Nigeria today, blockchain provides the youth a way to provide accountability, building applications. Now, let me quickly delve into what is blockchain. Dr. Roger Corrente touched a lot on this. I'm, I'm not going to bore you down, but I'm going to kind of uh, discuss it so that we understand where we are heading. Now, a blockchain is a cryptography hash encryption block of distributed ledger technology. You basically have books of an account that every node has a record of. That is how it provides accountability. Now, for each of those nodes, there is what we call consensus algorithm. So if you were thinking of mining currencies, yes, proof of work. This is what everyone knows. But if you need to look at counterfeit issues, you are not going to be generating tokens. Proof of stakes, there are other algorithms as well that you do not consume power, okay? These can be deployed on the cloud, have access to it, from the cloud, from their mobile phone. Now, this is how you verify uh, each of the book or each of the ledger, whether it's valid. That is what consensus algorithms is all about. Now, if you are creating money or token, then proof of work um, does that for you. Now, the other thing we are going to move on to is the smart contract, okay? So this is where the transaction happens. This is where the rules and orchestrations are. It is a programmable piece of code. When you hear, okay, in future, we, will, we are not going to need a lawyer. Yeah, this is what they are referring to, that all those terms and conditions are not programmed into code. That is what it's all about. Based on the conditions, then they, they run. And they are immutable, okay? This is pretty much the illustration of blockchain, a linear fork, um, or, uh, of a cipher block or a blockchain. This is how it looks like in the programmer perspective. Okay, so the takeaway from this slide is the consensus algorithms. I'm going to use them later and the smart contract, okay? Now, why do we need a blockchain, okay? Transparent ledger system, uh, we already know that. <laughs> Asset tracking, cryptocurrency, this is what everyone wants to hear, and this is what uh, everyone knows blockchain is, but blockchain has many other uh, usage. Fast automated 
payment, uh, supply chain, crowdfunding, just name them. Okay, so that is what um, uh, blockchain um, is all about. It is pervasive, uh, pervasive in everyday life. You now find blockchain apart from crowdfunding. Blockchain is in everywhere, even uh, social, um, uh, um, even governments um, tracking repairs. Uh, public uh, um, roads, uh, blockchain is not uh, has been implemented in all these um, areas. Uh, source of uh, coffee, just name them, uh, is all there. Now consensus algorithms. So there are a couple of them. So we have proof of work, uh, which I said uses a lot of electricity. We have proof of stake, uh, which more or less, depending on the members in the network, uh, you can always. Um, uh, uh, decide who validate uh, based on your stake in the network. Now we even have the practical Byzantine fault tolerance. So what that is is if there is a, um, a lot of nodes online, um, then the you, you use the um, the formula that uh, we have about three uh, F. For example, if we have seven uh, nodes, if if you take three F plus one of that. You find that uh, two times um, uh, two plus one that is five. So if you have seven nodes, if five are uh, available, then uh, that can be validated. We also have proof of elapsed time. These are actually variation of proof of stake. As I've said, um, these provides opportunity in Africa. And as time goes on, there is also a lot of benefit that people are moved up, then they can actually create a lot of solar power to actually power their uh, infrastructure. There is a lot of opportunity. Now that's the consensus algorithm. So the smart contract. So when we hear of uh, uh, DeFi, which uh, Prof also spoke about, what makes it possible is the smart contract. It, again, it's pretty much what I have said before, programmable um, terms and condition, trading partner uh, agreement, deterministic workflow, or uh, automated uh, step by steps. So it has like uh, the transaction capability, like receiving, sending, storing, immutable, you have always had, because when you have a contract, you don't just tear it off. That is what also happens in smart contract. It is stored in executable block. So if you look at this encrypted uh, block, um, this contract is also a part of them. Now, the way they bring data into these uh, blocks in a smart contract is called Oracle. Uh, this is where you have Oracle service. You hear about Oracle service most of the time. And there's a lot of opportunity there, medical um, um, records uh, being digitized in Africa, a lot of opportunities to pro uh, provide jobs, okay? Um, now, what is the use cases for smart contract? We have decentralized finance. This is what everyone loves, um, which is the beauty, uh, building principle of uh, DeFi. Uh, we have DApps applications, uh, which are more or less decentralized finance apps, um, fast automated payments, supply chain, crowdfunding. There are uh, examples there. You have MakerDAO, uh, which is a uh, decentralized stable coin pegged against the US dollars. We have Uniswaps as another example of permissionless or public liquidity token uh, swaps. Okay, so now let's begin to look at um, the blockchain itself, the mechanics behind uh, blockchain. Now, this is a slide you have seen before. Okay, now, blockchain was started by a uh, cipher uh, punks activity. The reason for that was for privacy of communication, protecting email. Now, back in Nigeria at the moment, there is a lot of uh, anger about uh, uh, things are not working. Now, this blockchain provides opportunity for the youth, and I wish they were here today to listen to the uh, message. Now, the cryptocurrency, uh, all we hear about is the Bitcoin. Bitcoin was uh, the blo was a blockchain concept that was implemented by uh, San uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, before Satoshi, there were a lot of uh, um, 
blockchain or cryptocurrency or digital cash that failed. Uh, I'll come to that in uh, subsequent uh, uh, slides. What is the motivation for digital currency? Technological advances, uh, lower uh, launch cost, easier to use, uh, new uh, processes and theory. Entrepreneurship, just as you have seen, a lot of fintech in, and DeFi um, um, spin-outs and startups. Financial inefficiency, high fees, um, we, as you have seen in remittances, um, you may have observed that um, the uh, block, uh, the cryptocurrency space has grown because of this. Uh, economic instability, uh, you have recession, inflation, unemployment. In fact, Venezuela um, actually launched their cryptocurrency uh, you, uh, just to uh, deal with a lot of um, inflations they were having. Uh, you also have politics. Uh, people just want to move away from the dollar. Um, so that is, that, that is one, uh, one of the motivation. Now, if you were from the university, if you want to conquer blockchain in your uh, in your fingertips, uh, these are some of the uh, pioneers uh, in their respective uh, respective um, contribution to blockchain. We have in 1940 Hans uh, Peter Norm, who works on the hash, hash algorithms, and this was actually what the um, in 1979 Merkle tr uh, hash tree um, uh, put together by um RAF uh, to actually have the uh, Meko uh, hash uh, tree. You have uh, Davy Chon who actually worked on it. Um, he came up with the first uh, electronic uh, currency, uh, but they had a problem, which was the double spending. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that project bankrupt in 1998. You have the uh, new uh, Cobix, uh, who works on the elliptic curve. Uh, this is what you hear in blockchain. Not to boil you down for those of you who are not from the um, research uh, school or um, studying this. So these are guys who have worked on this field before uh, Satoshi picked this paper up. So if you were a blockchain enthusiast, get uh, these readings and they uh, also looked at the references. Uh, by the time you are done with it, uh, you probably will be um, uh, having academia approach to uh, block uh, chain. Now, how does this tie up with, um, if you look at the Satoshi paper, this is the Bitcoin paper. This is what is being reinvented today. Um, so what I highlighted there is, uh, let me just read the first line. A pure peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash will allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through financial institution. That is what the blockchain is all about. And it is what is implemented in DeFi. Uh, it is what you see uh, today. Now, why did I bring this uh, paper? If you have to be in the blockchain ecosystem or cryptocurrency, you need to build your own project. Now, the way you build it is by looking at papers. It's, this is exactly what we have in JBBA. So if there was a project you were running, you probably will make reference to the publication, see how they do things so that you can stand on the shoulder of giants and be able to succeed. So as I have just uh, uh, put out in the three slides we have just looked at, you saw what happened before uh, Satoshi Nikamoto uh, came up with blockchain, which everyone um, sees today. There were failures, but by reading other people's paper, is able to come out with something that is now standing the test of time. Okay, so we have a paper there, uh, which is actually uh, written by Nassim and colleague, um, evidence-based blockchain finding uh, findings from a global study of blockchain. So if you want to look at the evidence-based blockchain across the world and startup company, this is something you should go and uh, look out for. Um, the JBBA uh, papers are, uh, are open access, so you could uh, have access to them. Now, there is a, an interesting one. Every time I get a, a request or I get messages, uh, how do I 
um, know the best cryptocurrency to invest in. Again, in the JBBA, there is an interesting paper there, which actually you read, you begin to uh, know what are the source of material, the evidence of truth, um, so that when you're investing in blockchain, you know what to do. Traditionally, people used to read uh, the best papers uh, of the day, like the Times of New York or those uh, international papers um, to be able to um, uh, know which are the best uh, uh, company to invest in. So the same thing you also do here. Now look for the peer review paper and be able to uh, find out which are the best uh, blockchain project and cryptocurrency project. Now, this is the uh, Bitcoin here. I'm not going to delve um, further into it, but what I want to point out here, I see a lot of, um, in Africa, there's a lot of tribe going on or a lot of a uh, group um, just propagating, okay? So this is the idea behind it. So for you to be able to create any uh, coin or any token, you need to create a crowd a network. Now you begin to maintain scarcity. So that is what happens in Bitcoin. Today you have Bitcoin uh, going over 10,000 or 9,000 uh, uh, pounds, depending on the time you look at it. Okay, now the next thing I want to move into is the open source platform. So for you to build um, a blockchain product, or projects, <laughs> you need an affordable uh, platform. So this is why you need to start looking at Linux. Um, because if you tie into any of those um, uh, proprietary operating system or applications uh, that are out there, you, you are just uh, one of the numbers um, providing, just excuse me, uh, right. So you are just one of the numbers providing a business for whoever that that uh, seller is. Um, you need to uh, create your own project. So Linux is one thing you need to look at. And also you need to be able to write code. If you are in the university, you really want to make it big in this area. Um, a lot of people are looking at um, um, things like Python, which is quite popular these days, there are C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, you name them, okay? Right, now, what do they say about open source? Um, you find that a lot of um, stakeholders in industries, um, open source actually drive 95% um, of the um, industry. Uh, before I uh, emerge, I have worked as a software developer and also um, uh, trading software application up to March uh, this year. Most of application we built, uh, most of they are open source. That is what we package together with a bit of code uh, that we sell to the public. Now, your cloud infrastructure is driven by 83% of open source. So if you hear any of these uh, servers in the cloud, it is driven by 83%. Okay, so if you look at security, 33% uh, uh, as compared to um, your locked in, 30% as compared, a lower cost of ownership as compared to your locked in system or proprietary system. Uh, it has better security uh, because they are driven online Linux. Um, so where you can find Linux uh, being used. Uh, if you think of security, 52%. Cloud management tools, about 51%. Database, 49%. So if Africa is to build sustainable um, uh, blockchain, they have to look at open source uh, based on Linux platform. Okay, so these are uh, samples of some open source. We have Ethereum. Um, Hyperledger is one enterprise one. Within Hyperledger, you have Hyperledger, uh, Sawtooth, Iroha, Fabric, and Borrow. Uh, you also have uh, Corda, Hydra Chain, Multi Chain, Open Chain. These are some popular open source that are there. So if you are on um, crypto space, you probably will be interested in Ethereum. Uh, but if not, uh, you have the Hyperledger and other Linux, Linux initiatives to build your own uh, project. 
Okay, so this is where I'm going to stop today. It's uh, unfortunate that the crowd that would have benefited um, a lot have not been able to uh, join because of the ongoing events in in Lagos. Um, so thanks um, everyone. And uh, um, what we are going to do now, so if you have questions, do ask. If not, please, let's, there are a few of us left here. Let's meet up in the chat. Uh, we are all going to um, go to chat so that we'll be able to speak to each other. But before then, Nassim, is there a question? Are there questions on the chat, please? So, <clears throat> Solomon, thank you. Excellent talk. Um, okay. We had one question um, a couple of days ago from uh -huh. um, one of the startups. Um, in fact, actually, we have been approached by actually two or three. Um, and th their, their question was, so I'm going to I'm going to write my you know white paper and I have an idea I have a, I have a solution. Um, so how can I how can I get it right in the first time and make sure that I am following the evidence based practice and I am on the right track. Um, so where to get more information and education and uh, can they reach out to BBA directly or to you? These are these are the startups and blockchain projects in Africa I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. That, that, is, uh, that is an interesting question. I think uh, we will we'll both share the um, answer to that question. Yes. Yeah, so um, to be able to uh, start a project successfully, you do not need to double it to it. You need to read. You need to, uh, like the JBBA has quite a lot of excellent materials in one place. Um, uh, that is the good thing about uh, the JBBA, uh, the Journal of British Blockchain Association, that you can go in, there are a lot of projects. These are live projects so uh, that people have implemented, that people have worked on. Most of the um, authors in, J, uh, uh, in the JBBA are people who are working in the field. They are in the profession. So you will find some references there, uh, white paper to actually look at so that to recalibrate what you intend to uh, do. Um, that is a good a good place to start. Um, I, if you were to go into Google, uh, there's a lot of materials there. They are all over the place. Some of them are written by students who just want to get their papers published. But it's not peer review. But places like the, uh, J, uh, the JBBA um, has papers that are peer reviews that are uh, handy for you to actually work on. Uh, stand on the shoulders of uh, people who have actually done the job and be able to um, get your project started without failure. Now, I will leave the other parts to um, Dr. Nassim, who is the president of the JBBA, to also expatiate on what I have just said. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. Um, I would say go back to uh, the PCIO framework, the problem comparison intervention outcome framework of evidence-based blockchain. Um, so what, what exactly is the problem that you're trying to solve? It does, is, there, is there a problem that actually exists? What is the evidence that the problem exists? And when we did our, our research study, we looked at uh, around more than 500 uh, uh, blockchain and crypto startups and projects. Uh, the one Solomon was talking about the paper. And we found out some, some statements, for example, um, our solution will transform and completely revolutionize, you know, A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And what does that mean in terms of numbers, as one of the speakers was saying earlier, in terms of data? Because when you're talking to the policymakers and governments, um, you you can't just use that, you know, blanket statements and gr grandiose claims like, you know, we will transform, we will revolutionize, or we will completely overhaul. You have to talk numbers, you have to talk data, you have to talk evidence. So first of all, you have to define what exactly is the problem you're trying to solve, how big is it, and who is talking about it. 
a problem that is being discussed at the United Nations, at IMF, at uh, at at, uh, at other uh, institutions, is problem worth addressing compared to a problem that is very very small that that doesn't even exist, and that's what happened in the ICO phase. We saw many projects that basically just died um, because there was no need for those uh, solutions in the first place. So. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you have to look at what's the what's the state of affairs. Who else is trying to solve the problem? Because if somebody has already solved the problem better than you, further down the line, governments, enterprises are going to take your competitor's solution and going to ignore you because you have to be better than them, better in terms of cost effectiveness, better in terms of efficiency as one of the speakers was saying the effectiveness uh and and there are many other parameters so you have to be able to demonstrate that you are better than your competitors in a competitive market to have a competitive advantage and that's why i talk about evidence-based blockchain because it gives you a competitive advantage if you say hang on i have the evidence you don't and then the next thing is you just demonstrate that your own uh intervention uh, as Solomon was saying, you publish your paper, you put it to peer review. Has it been peer reviewed by experts? Is it independently evaluated? And what are the outcomes of your your product, your project, your solution? And many, many, many papers and data is not peer reviewed, is not critically evaluated. And that's the problem that occurs when it reaches the, the higher level. Then we find the deficiencies, we find the flaws, as I mentioned in my example of the United States, where nine out of 10 programs were never evaluated in those decade. And it was costing the US economy $90 billion, $90 billion, not million. And that's a huge, huge amount of money, especially when you're talking about emerging economies where funds are tight, resources are very scarce. So we can't afford to lose uh, those resources and uh, without uh, having a solid scientific research base. And this is what we do basically at the Center for Evidence-Based Blockchain with our members. Um, we spend a lot of time on education. Um, we, we spend a lot of time on making sure that the, they have the resources, they have the knowledge to evaluate their own project um, and, and critically analyze it before somebody else does. And I think that's what evidence-based practice is. Um, so the, my, my answer to, to that question is that um, this is how you practice. And there is a lot. Of, please read the paper that we have published, first of all. It has got the framework. It has got the questions, the 12 questions, the four PCIO framework, the 12 questions, how to implement, uh, how to apply. It's very easy. Anybody can do it. And everybody should do it. Uh, and if you have any queries, any problems, we are around. I am on LinkedIn. Dr. Solomon Wak Bule is there, and many of our advisors and 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 uh, uh, chairs are already on LinkedIn, social media. You can reach out to them. You can reach out to us, and to find out how we can help you. So I, I hope that uh, answers the question. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Nassim, uh, uh, for that. Okay, so let's uh, look out for questions um, in the chat. As I said, um, we have the uh, Coin News Extra, extra um, here. We have quite um, some uh, participants uh, who are here. Uh, guys, do not uh, just uh, sign off. Uh, we are now. We are all now heading to. Uh, the lobby or lounge, uh, we will all meet there, chat there, we can chat face to face. Um, for some of you who have not been able to speak to anyone, uh, what you do is when I come off stage, there will be tables. Then when you join, you will see, it will ask you to activate your mic and camera. We can chat to each other just as I and uh, Dr. Uh, I and other speakers have been doing all along. We can see each other face to face. Please do not just drop off. Come and talk to us. Um, okay, meet us at the um, table. Uh, before I leave, so that we don't leave anyone behind, there's no question 
I can't see anyone. Doctor, Doctor Nassim, did you see any? Yeah, no, I don't see anything here. Okay, there's no question. Okay, no, there's nothing right. here. I can't. See. Okay, guys, oh, thanks all of you uh, for coming. Uh, watch out, um, uh, watch out the um, British Blockchain Association web uh, uh, LinkedIn page. Um, any event, there is an event coming up in Singapore in March next year. And before then, there may be some other events that will come up. We were expecting over a hundred plus registration from Nigeria today, uh, because of the events in Nigeria, uh, the internet is inter interrupted. Uh, some of the speakers are not even able to join us as well. Um, uh, we are very sorry for those who have lost their life uh, there. Uh, so we are going to go uh, to. Uh, the lounge now or the lobby so that we all network and speak to each other before uh, the event come to a close. We will all leave from there. And again, thanks all of you for coming to this event. Um, it's not, though it's not uh, yet ended, we are all going to be networking. Uh, please come there and chat with us. Um, uh, thanks again for attending this event. So head straight to uh, the lobby or lounge at this point in time join the table you need to click to join to to be able to join any table okay see you thank there you. thank you so much. okay you are welcome